organize this seminar uh, with Robert Bettini over in Civil Engineering, who is down in Salem today uh, meeting on a project that he's working on dealing uh, with finance and tolling. And perhaps we'll have him uh, present something on that either in the winter or the spring, because some of the issues came up last week about VMT fees and stuff like that, and he's looking into the technology to collect those types of fees. So that's where he is and couldn't be here. And then I um, actually have to apologize that I have to go to a meeting right after this, so I need to leave too. So in terms of logistics for the students, I'm passing around the little sign-in sheet, and then I'm going to ask, uh, Teresa's going to... Um, collect it, and then those of you who are registered with me, if you want to hand her your question, because we're meeting later on today, so she'll give that to me. Or if you want to email it to me, whatever, it's fine. Um, the other thing, for those of you out in Webland, uh, we unfortunately do not have our laptop uh, network hookup, so if you email a question to us, there's not going to be anyone here to read it um, and then ask the speaker. Uh, you're welcome to still email it. <laughs> Uh, but it won't get answered live. Um, so anyway, uh, and a reminder, when we do get to questions and answers, a reminder to people who are here in the room to press the touch button, as I am demonstrating right now, and keep it, hold it down for the entire time you are speaking so the people who are either listening live or on the archive can hear the questions and not just the answer. Okay, without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker. And um, this topic has been one on, on our agenda that looks a little different from normal. I think what is quite interesting about this is that it, it clearly demonstrates how transportation issues pop up in disciplines and places throughout what we do. Um, and so I think it's going to be quite interesting. And I will be watching it on the web, archived web uh, cast. We have Andrew Wilson from the U.S. Forest Service. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to him. is leaving and but, <laughs> but, yeah, but we'll, we'll manage anyways um, I, uh, I originally called uh, Dr. Bertini because I wanted some ad advice on how to proceed with this question I had and uh, he suggested I put on a seminar and have all of you give me the answers I'm looking for so the results portion of this uh, presentation will be a little short because I haven't got to the results yet and uh, I have started to analyze some of the data and we'll go on from there um, what I won't cover today is uh, or, or is uh, large fires. We're just talking about initial attacks of so these fires, these uh, you know biggest fires of the last 50 years you've seen in, in uh, New Mexico and in, in Oregon and Arizona. Uh, we're not concerned with that. We're concerned with the initial attack of fires, how uh, are the, uh, the small fires, lightning strikes, uh, hunter fires, uh, and getting to them quickly and putting them out. Um, we're not going to. I'm not going to discuss whether or not fires should be put out. Uh, the recent forest health initiative that the president has come up with, or the whole fuels loading and fuels reduction, or under the assumption that we're going to put out some fires and what's the best way to respond to those uh, and, and the funding to suppress uh, to have the suppression forces in place. Uh, like I said, is is to look at the uh, the funding of. Uh, or to look at uh, how to come about uh, suppressing these uh, fires. And historically, we uh, have already looked at uh, the aerial delivery of firefighters. Uh, in that was primarily looking at air tankers and smoke jumpers, uh, national shared resources for uh, attacking fires. What we followed on to is what we're calling WIRUS, the wildfire initial response assessment system, which tears the national or regional perspective down to a forest level um, assessment. It looks at the, the regional supply of uh, these shared resources and, and then t tears it down to a na uh, national forest level uh, ground forces. And in all these uh, models, 
it simply assigns the closest appropriate resource to the fire um, to, to attack that fire, which means that if it's a bulldozer, it's not going to be in the list of available resources for a wilderness fire, for example. And then uh, after I get done describing more of the, this uh, simulation systems, I'll talk about some of the methods I'm using to uh, deal with the travel time model that we're, I'm trying to develop and the current status, and then look forward to your feedback. Uh, my background, I started with the Forest Service uh, a long time ago as a firefighter. I've done uh, inventory, vegetation inventory for fire and timber res res uh, resources. Uh, about 10 years ago, I uh, got into GIS. and uh, I was uh, the lead analyst for both the Spot Owl EISs as well as the Interior Columbia Basin Project, a, a seven-state analysis, a water uh, basin analysis. Uh, I've spent some time in industry um, providing GIS services uh, to a company up in western Washington. And then about in April, I started this, my most recent job as a resource information specialist with the uh, fire lab. This uh, area of delivery firefighting study was the uh, precursor to the, the study I'm working with now that, that uh, I'm developing the model for. I thought it was useful to look at this uh, in our, uh, my talk here because it was the precursor. It was a, a broader scale model, uh, looked at shared resources, like I said, uh, large air tankers, smoke jumpers, uh, shared helicopters, and uh, looked at airports primarily as the bases where they operated out of. And uh, once again, it just had to go to the closest airport uh, and see if there's resources there. If there weren't resources there, it'd go further out. There's a, a smaller problem. There's uh, just a fixed number of airports is dealing with. Uh, and also, planes could make straight shots to uh, from the airport to the uh, fire location, so they, uh, you didn't have to worry about travel time so much. They, they, uh, uh, wind, uh, wind speed or whatever really wasn't isn't a factor in those situations. So what we, uh, after the aerial delivered firefighter study uh, was completed, we wanted to go on and tear this down into a, a forest planning level uh, to help look at uh, staffing levels and funding levels for the firefighting uh, staff in a, at a forest level. Uh, we look at the same regional model to ensure that uh, we don't just grab all the, all the available resources or all the resources, regional shared resources, because there can be other events going on in other places that draw down that pool of resources. Uh, this model also incorporates the ground resources explicitly, each um, you know, ground crews and, and uh, engines and, and dozers and all. And topography is a factor because there's a, a good deal of topography out there. Uh, good, uh, and roads are a lot easier to travel on. Uh, the model works by uh, looking at historical fire uh, seasons and goes over and starts at the beginning of the season and has uh, basically runs through time and as there's an ignition the uh, simulation system responds with these closest resources as the fire burns the perimeter of the fire increases as resources are applied they have crew person equivalents that will build chain with the foresters use chains as a unit of measurement still 66 feet is a chain they build chain around the fire and so once the fire is contained once the chain built is exceeds the amount of perimeter the fire is declared out um, there's a little bit of lag time before the, all the resources are released because they have to make sure the fire is uh, actually controlled in addition to being contained and uh, then they return back to their base in this in the current version of the model and then they're, they're available for re, uh, reassignment to another fire and once again, they look at the closest uh, appropriate resources. Uh, this, like I said, still contains uh, aerial components and shared, most of these are shared. Uh, the heavy tankers are the, the classic uh, firefighting uh, retardant dropping airplanes that you see on TV. Uh, single engine air tankers are uh, getting wider use. Uh, they're smaller. The, uh, these are essentially uh, fertilize, run fertilizing operations in the uh, winter time down in the, the southeast, and then they come up during the summertime and drop retardant on planes. They're kind of neat because they're portable. They have this little trailer here that will uh, uh, 
they can hook up on the back of their truck and go to a uh, small airstrip and set up there. They get supplied with water and retardant. They'll mix retardant and can then they'll be closer to the fire and can make quicker turnarounds to drop up to like 500 gallons, which is small small amount compared to the heavy tankers, but it's uh, sufficient for small fires and to keep fires in check. Uh, we also deal with smoke jumpers and uh, helicopters, both as uh, means to supply uh, firefighting resources on the ground as well as delivering water and, and retardant. The, uh, the uh, portion of the, the wildfire initial response assessment model that uh, we're going into greater detail is, is dealing with the ground components. Uh, hand crews are uh, delivered um, by, by vehicle usually or by helicopter. We have engines. Um, these engines uh, travel both on the road and they'll, like in this case, can travel off the road. Uh, given the correct topography, they can't just go anywhere, but on uh, for tops of ridges, flat areas, they'll travel a fair distance off the road. Uh, and we have tenders which will deliver water, whether to a, a fire um, where engines are working so they don't have to run back and forth to water supplies or, or to an uh, air tanker base. Uh, and then uh, Bulldozers as well have, have a fairly slow speed, very slow getaway time, just because they're usually contract operations and they are bigger and heavier equipment and need bigger roads to, to travel on. Where we're working for 2002 is on the Umatilla National Forest out in, in eastern Oregon. Uh, it's uh, a, a good place because it, uh, for, for me at least, because the topography is fairly varied on the the. Uh, South and uh, west portion of the forest is fairly flat and rolling, and then it's much more dissected and steep in the, the north and the east portion of the uh, forest. And we'll, you'll be able to see some of that in a slide here in the future. And also the uh, staff uh, on the forest uh, dispatch and, and the personnel working fires were knowledgeable and receptive to uh, our doing study there. The next slide after this one will uh, be a visualization that we've done uh, using this uh, simulation model. Uh, there's a lot going on in there, so I have this little cheat sheet. I can't show them both at the same time, so you have to remember this for the next slide. And uh, I can stop and go into it further. There's pluses where fires are uh, identified as they're uh, identified, they're yellow, and they, once they're assigned resources, they turn colors plains. There's three or four different kinds of plains we'll have to look at. Uh, ground resources, uh, you'll see how they are traveling in a straight line from the base to the fires uh, at various speeds. Uh, and then there's a, a number of different bases that the uh, crews work out of. One of the uh, situations that happens is once a fire, or fire is uh, suppressed, uh, put out, the firefighters end up having to go back to the base under the current model because there's no way to keep track of where they all are and the distances that they would take to get to the next fire. And what I want to do is, uh, with this travel model, is have something that's quick enough for the simulation model to uh, be able to instantaneously look at all the available resources, no matter where they are, whether they're en route or at, at a fire that's just been put out, and go from there to the fires rather than having to go all the way back to the base and go back out. Because there's quite a bit of travel time uh, on some of these area, uh, fires to get back to the base to be re-dispatched. Now it's the tricky part. So this is the uh, Umatilla National Forest and Pendleton is, is right up here. Uh, this is Hepner, uh, Walla Walla is up here. Uh, there's, this is the area that's fairly, fairly uh, rolling and it's more steep and dissected. And, and as you go off the the map there, Hills Canyon, would be off over here. And this is the Columbia River to give you a sense of what's going on. You can see a number of yellow uh, strikes down here. This is uh, in 1994, I believe, August 11th, 445 in the morning. Uh, the resources, is, uh, they don't get started until 8 o'clock in the morning. That's just was the rule that we said in the model to make things simple. With this many uh, lightning strikes, a, a rather large lightning storm came through. and 
and they're already at four in the morning. There's these uh, yellow crosses have already been identified as uh, fires, going fires. So we'll watch those as well as uh, there's these ground resources are the, the little dots here, usually engines. Uh, over in Le Grand, there's these blue dots or, or blue planes are uh, heavy air tankers. We have some single engine tankers there. And then you'll see the helicopters uh, coming out of places like Fraser here. Um, How are they identified within the model? There's a, if, if it's working with GPSS, it's a simulation model and it works off of lists. The table, there's scores of lists inside there of, of what the different resources are and where they are, where they're assigned. So it's play, play data? No, no, these are actual, uh, is the, the actual uh, staffing, actual vehicles, capacities, uh, capabilities that are out there. Uh, they start the simulation beginning of the year with all the resources uh, in appropriate locations. McCall has an X number of jumpers and, and uh, Grangeville has a certain number of jumpers. Tankers start off at their, their base locations. And then as a model runs through, they can change, can boost to different places. Uh, the various districts have a set level, staffing level. They, uh, Hepner may have uh, four engines and, and two ground crews, and that's where they start off at. Another question? Go ahead. Sorry, so those are real fires? Yes, this is from the 1994 season. Uh, those, it's a real incident. Uh, the lightning storm came through, and these are actual locations. We've looked at coming up with our own fires. You know, saying, oh, let's just throw a bunch across the, the, the landscape randomly, but that isn't isn't uh, they don't end up in the same places where the fires actually end up often. Uh, this is just a sure way of saying, you know, these are some pretty bad situations. Um, how, how would the uh, system respond to this? And so we can change staffing levels in, in the model and change assumptions about what we'll do, whether we'll send ground forces into, into a wilderness areas down here or if they'll all be done, uh, attacked by smoke jumpers, helicopters, air resources. Um, that help? One more? Press the button. Are the resource locations updated real time using GPS? How does that work? GPSS with two S's is a simulation model right now. I mean, we're still this is just a model, and uh, this uh, in the in, while the model is going on, yes, it's there. As an event occurs, the model kicks in and says, "Oh, what happens?" And then it goes on to the next event occurring. The graphics program, the visualization program, takes output from that GPSS program. It's a simulation package and does these graphics for, to help visualize it. And there isn't GPS, which is one S, involved here, here at this point. I'll get it to that later. Oh. Anything else? Okay, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, <laughs> glad that's not my laptop. <laughs> I'll go on from here and, and we'll see it in, uh, if there is something that comes up, we can stop it as well. You can watch the uh, the time clicking here, and, and that's probably the important thing. And you can see a, a bunch of new fires being reported as the lookouts are, uh, as it gets light enough that the lookouts can see the fires. Uh, a lot of fires are being reported. It's 6.15. Only one awake so far are the lookouts. And here about 8 o'clock, everyone. Now, you, I, I stopped the uh, simulation here, the, the visualization. You can see uh, that things are starting to move. You see a, a cluster of uh, ground resources coming out here. Uh, these, I believe there's a helicopter flying here. You'll see it choppering around. Uh, this is a small tanker, I believe. We'll, you'll see... Uh, Planes coming off from up that direction in Grangeville, as well as I believe they have some planes coming from down here that continue to uh, hit some of the fires. And then the big thing is the uh, there's an air tanker base in the Grand where a lot of air tankers are dropping, or heavy air tankers are uh, dropping supplies. Wow. And so it, and this is a pretty big incident. I can't remember if there's how many if there's 80 fires or not. And there's flotillas of these planes going back and forth and
one of the things, I'm stopping again, is that you see that these uh, all go in straight lines to wherever they're going to. There was, it's not quite that simple. They're going in different speeds also, the, the ground resources. Some of them uh, just travel faster than other ones. And that's because they have different, uh, different distances they're traveling. They may, given the model right now, they say this is how long it's going to take, but the visualization makes them go further or closer. They're, they're, the time of travel is based on a representative fire location. And that's, as you'll see in a, a future uh, slide, is what, uh, one of the things I want to fix. And this stops about 8 o'clock, so... Is, and this, it, like I said, is is all being simulated. The simulation starts at the, the beginning of the fire season and rolls on through. So there have been some changes in staffing levels at different, uh, usually that's uh, where the, the air tankers are based, possibly, or the, well, the national resources get shifted around based on how the fire season progresses through time. We're looking at a, a time lapse here? Yeah. The, the, the clock... The clock's ticking at 15-minute intervals. There, there can be events occurring more often than that. Every time the way GPS is set up, every time an event occurs, uh, it, it starts thinking and, and doing its simulation programming. But you can see the, the time ticking at 15-minute intervals. One more. I'm just wondering, do you make a lot of decisions based on the simulation while it's running, or no? You, you this is it's used more for gaming, and then you look at the uh, results of how many escaped fires you have, and, and how how big the fires grew, and, and look at the resources that were affected at that point. What do you mean by escape fires? Those are fires that you don't get control of right away, and they become larger and larger. Uh, basically, if you can't get on top of them in 24 hours. Um, you're assuming that they're getting bigger, and as they get bigger, it, it turns into a whole different chain of command. You don't look at initial attack, you're looking at uh, bringing in commands, uh, uh, higher levels of incident commands that uh, deal with bigger fires and all the logistics and uh, that, that go along with that. Um, and like I said, we're not going to look at larger fires just because there's, it's, you, you, that's when you start bringing in these, these 20 person crews and from from uh, the southeast and, and uh, the Australians come over and, and heavy tankers start you know, cycling around on top of it. So it's, it's a different problem than what we're looking at. Go ahead. What we're looking at right now is after the fact, but while it's going on, how do you coordinate all of these efforts at the same time so that everybody's not running into each other? Is it kind of like a miniature air traffic control it is with a land component? Or? Like I said, there's a simulation, and, and we're doing this in 2002, and this fire season occurred in 1994. But there is a uh, interagency uh, dispatch center in Pendleton that deals, when there's a situation like this, we'll deal with, with uh, dispatching the, the various resources and, and making requests if it needs shared resources, they'll request to uh, the office, the, the geographic uh, coordinating office, uh, the geographic area coordinating uh, office here in Portland, and they'll tie into the national office as more and more resources are needed. Go ahead. If it sure is, especially. It, it sure can be, it, uh, especially after this, you know, last year when people uh, in, uh, in in Western Washington. Uh, it's probably one of the the biggest uh, um, uh, things that people think about is is doing things safely. It's, it's better to let the fire go than to put people's lives at risk, uh, and it takes a lot of coordination. And there's there are, as you get more and more operations going on, you. Uh, Get more and more people. You'll have someone uh, brought in just to deal with air, and then someone will deal in just sectors, different sectors, and, and so the, the chain of command grows as that as more and more resources get uh, uh, used, and to make sure that everyone knows where everyone is, so that you uh, you don't have problems, accidents, people not getting fed, that kind of thing. And uh, 
you can see that some of those ground resources have gone back. They were red when they were going up, and now they're coming back down, going to more fires. Go ahead. There are planes that are um, coming in from outside of the modeling area. Are those resources that are coming into the fire zone outside of the map? Yes. That you have? Yeah. The Redmond, uh, McCall, uh, Grangeville all have close by bases. Um, Portland uh, has the air tanker facility where they, I mean, it's fairly far away from here. Uh, that's why we had the, the ADFS study looked at the regional and shared resources, and this is tearing off of the national or the regional uh, model that's run in the past. Uh, if there are fires in other places, those resources won't be available necessarily. And so it's uh, uh, one of the potential problems now with the current planning is that you can assume that all those shared resources are available, and they aren't always available. You know, if they're off way far away, there may be other fires just on the other side that we can't see within the, the model. Even here, we can see, uh, we could, there were, earlier on, there were fires off over here on the Willow Whitman, and they continue on into Hell's Canyon and off into Idaho. It, when the storm came through, there was a series of fires off in, in Idaho from the same cell. We should be close to, oops, just not run that again. So the, the, by running these simulations, we can see what the, uh, the really important uh, pieces are, and one of those is, is a multi-fire day like what we had there. If there's just one or two fires, there's plenty of resources usually in a, in a day to take care of it. Uh, it's those days when there are multiple fires uh, that we have problems. Uh, and like we said, the shared resources, if the air tankers are all pointing the other direction, we won't be able to use any of those. Uh, rules of dispatch, if we, uh, you know, what sort of uh, rules they have for different areas. Uh, what value are you putting on different resources uh, uh, depicts or makes it a function of how you respond to it and what the uh, the weather is, how uh, dry the, the weather is, out, how uh, dangerous, uh, how much likelihood there will be that the fires will be escaping will um, be a function of uh, will uh, tell you how you're going to respond to the uh, particular fire. And then the longer it takes the resource to get to the fire and size it up and start putting line around it, the more time the fire has to grow. And the, more, the bigger the fire is, the more resources you then would have to use to, to build line around it. And so like we've talked, or like I've said, this, we're using representative fire locations, which makes the, uh, it, it isn't quite right. There's a lot of uh, terrain in between the, the bases and where the fires are that make it uh, travel uh, Difficult, even if you're uh, even if you're on the, the, the better roads, they're still pretty windy, and, and they're uh, going around the mountains instead of straight through them. And currently, we're also dealing with uh, just latitude, longitude, uh, and there's some differences between going east, west, and north, south. But it's not really a square world that when you're dealing with angular measures. Uh, so what we need as far as improving that model is, is dealing with uh, the different modes of transportation. We have different sorts of vehicles as well as fires that aren't close to the road are uh, attacked by foot. So we need to have two different models um, of, of travel for each individual uh, response. Uh, if a fire is off the road, we, we'll have to have the portion where you get to the fire, close to the fire by vehicle and then the portion where you travel by foot. If, you are, uh, if we get beyond having to respond or return to the base each time there's a fire, we want to move to the point where as soon as the uh, fire has been put out and they're assured that it's, it's been uh, put out or if the resource has been released either before it reaches the fire or after it re releases, uh, reaches the fire, that we can reassign the, the uh, resource in place rather than having to go back to a known location. Uh, and then there's also multiple fires. The fires can occur anywhere. So that kind of one of the uh, thoughts is that we could use a, the standard network uh, least cost kind of uh, model, but there's so many different starting points and ending points that we didn't think that would really work very well of uh, making a list or 
dealing with a network that went to so many different places. And the uh, variance of the estimates, uh, you know, we can make an estimate. How much does the, uh, the actual time vary around that? We can, if by having a model, we can come up with variances so that then we can put that into the model and perturb the, uh, uh, the travel time by a unknown amount. We ha have some uh, back, uh, reason to uh, vary, uh, apply a distribution to the travel time. And then we also need it fast so that we can use it within a simulation system. Uh, and that kind of throws out all the LP solutions. Uh, existing forest travel time models, uh, we're already using the Euclidean straight line model. There's uh, anecdotal uh, models for foot travel. This, is a, this one is uh, Naismith is a, a fellow in I believe from Scotland came up with a rule where people would travel at five kilometers an hour, and then for elevation change, they would you would add an hour for their travel time. Uh, the Forest Service has uh, worked a lot on uh, road design using logging trucks. Uh, in 1960, there's a, a lot of logging trucks around. Uh, there's time is money uh, by putting too many bends in the road. It makes the travel time longer, uh, fewer cycles. Uh, and the, the model that they came up with in 1960 was uh, verified again in, in 96. That type of information is still being looked at. Uh, but still, that's working along a network of roads. And we uh, have the off-road travel of vehicles as well as the, uh, the walking. And so that kind of, we use information out of that, or I'm using information out of that. But I, I think we'll go another route. And then there's also. Uh, in the recreation arena, there's been some studies on uh, how long it takes tra hikers to travel on trails and the travel cost method evaluation of resource worth, um, you know, how long it takes people to get there, times their wage, plus the cost of traveling. And I didn't think that was uh, really applicable to where we were, were going. So what, we've, what we're looking for is something that works across the landscape and is fast and can use these um, Various factors of, of of the roads, vehicle types, and topography um, beyond the the road topography information, but topography for uh, travel on foot. Um, what I uh, decided to do was come up with basically a, a surface, a travel resistance model, um, where where there's roads, where there's paved highways, there's a real low resistance to travel, and as you get to uh, coarser and coarser roads, the resistance to travel grows, and once you get off roads, it, 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 the resistance is even greater. Uh, and foot travel has a whole different uh, level of resistance uh, as well, because it's, well, it's relatively easier. There's, there's not much difference between walking on a road and walking across flat land, and, and there's trails. Uh, it should work for, uh, for foot traffic as well. It, the forest has GIS information across, at least within the forest boundaries, is fairly uh, extensive within the forest boundaries and fairly complete. Uh, and uh, we have uh, an algorithm that should help speed up um, analyzing the least cost path across the surface that uh, we've been developing, which I'll get into in the next slide. And there's also, uh, with this travel resistance surface, a uh, need to decide what those resistances are across the surface and uh, it, do that through acquiring empirical data. This uh, fast scheme for determining distance, uh, travel time across a, a surface, we're looking at a simplified version of a, a surface in an imaginary route here. Uh, it would, if we started up in the uh, upper left and we're traveling down here to the, the lower right, it would uh, select this as the least cost or possibly select this as the least cost uh, route at the base level. If these are each one of these, uh, I'm dealing with uh, elevation models as my base uh, level. Uh, so I'm looking at either 30 meters or 100 meter type of data, uh, which is, once you start looking at a force, that's an awful lot of data. So we simplify it up by basically pyramiding up, taking, um, for example, these four cells and collapsing them into one larger cell and saying that the uh, cost to travel across it is, is, at this point, is two 
the resistance is, is a, a moderate resistance. And we continue on, and, and uh, you can keep tearing up, and so you go to different levels of the, of the simplification. And, and the simpler you get, there's costs and errors of your estimate. Um, and by knowing that, once again, we can make adjustments in the, uh, in the simulation. So uh, the last part of that was, uh, of the, was that we needed some data to back this up to build this, this resistance models. Uh, and uh, the, the best thing I could think of was looking at fires and seeing how long it actually took vehicles, engines, crews to get from wherever they're starting from to where, where they're going and then apply that across these, these data that we, we have. There's a, a I decided to go three ways, deal with three different uh, ways to acquire the data. One is a, uh, a logging system within the vehicle. Another one is uh, records, fire dispatch records. Uh, there's, it's the government, so everything is recorded. And, uh, and then there's a real-time tracking system, which is uh, similar to what you'd imagine uh, seeing in, in a, uh, a city or a county emergency center or police center where you could follow vehicles uh, in real time across the train uh, on a console. The vehicle position logging system is uh, simpler and uh, it's currently available and this is a, a shot of one of the systems that we've installed. Here's this little black box that we've zip tied onto a, a steering column inside a, a, a engine. Uh, it doesn't require any input from anyone except the person getting the data off the card after it's been installed. But it also is only inside of vehicles where there's a power supply and, and wiring. The, the crew, this is what the crew sees, so it's you know, out of sight, out of mind. Um, one of the problems is that is always collecting data, so they, uh, they roll it from the, uh, from the station to the gas station and they're picking up data. They, uh, they take it out on a project, they're still picking up data. And so we need to decide, there's an awful lot of data. You know, I'm looking at now, we'll see the data I'm looking at now is uh, for a month's worth of data, there's 80,000 points. And a lot of that data is just uh, driving around the compound, in and out, warming the engine up. And uh, there are uh, schemes in there so you don't get data while you're parked or while you're not moving, but still there's a lot of data that doesn't go anywhere. So we want to tie into the dispatch records, which uh, keep track of the instant locations and which resources are involved, when they're involved, and when they uh, arrive at the fires or when, or when they're released. Uh, the problem is there's a lot of handwritten information there. It's not all uh, database accessible. Um, and then also uh, what I'm looking at is, is having the actual engines uh, and crews keep track um, through just regular consumer grade GPS helps them know where they are as well as uh, if they do a travel diary type of uh, record keeping to help me know when and where they're going so that I get, only get their actual dispatch responses. Um, for the real-time tracking system, and as you saw this is Eastern Oregon, I don't know, people probably have driven around uh, whether they're supposed to or not, they're driving while they're driving and or talking while they're driving and uh, I, I don't ever do that, but I, I, I know some people do. And uh, as you're going through uh, more remote places, the coverage goes in and out. And that's on the interstate. When you, once you got the interstate, as you recall from the, the maps, there, there's, there's some pretty remote places, and there isn't coverage. Satellites uh, pretty much cover everywhere, uh, but they're, it's pretty expensive to keep those kind of operations going. Uh, and so what we do have with the Forest Service is a pretty extensive radio network that connects pretty much across the forest. There's still holes where there isn't much coverage. And with this interagency dispatch center, it's also an interagency type of uh, setup. So we're getting more than just the Forest Service um, operations. Uh, there is a unit out there that adds on, is basically bolts on to the uh, existing radios, co co goes over the repeaters. It has a GPS involved with it. Uh, that GPS is continually collecting signals. And when you release the mic on a uh, uh, radio traffic, uh, uh, radio conversation, the uh, mobile unit will send a data burst containing that location, the, the coordinate location, 
um, back to the dispatch, and that will then come up on a screen. A console will say, oh, this is where that uh, engine or that resource is. And it's pretty re real time. It's not, it's not keeping track of where everyone is every minute. It's, it's basically we have a setup so it'll just keep track of when they talk. Uh, once again, just kind of sh uh, sh shorten down the amount of uh, information. Uh, this, the other good point about this is it also works with handheld radios, and so they can use this outside of the vehicle. Uh, it ends up with a uh, text data log, an ASCII text data log that then has to be brought into a database. Um, it's a pretty good idea, it seemed like, but uh, the product wasn't shipped until mid-season, and we're still working on getting some pieces uh, sent back and reshipped. It seemed like it was built on a, the same kind of model that software producers use. They, they ship it, and then they find some of the bugs, and then they send out patches and, and things that you should do, reloading the, the software kind of thing. Uh, so it's still, I haven't gotten data off of that system yet. Um, there is a data burst at the end that makes noise when people are talking on the radio that's different than where it was before, which I thought would be a problem, but people seem to accept fairly well. And the handhelds, uh, there's an extra package for the GPS, there's an extra microphone, and there's wires, there's extra battery consumption that we haven't really resolved yet, how that will all pan out. Uh, implementing what we have implemented, uh, those vehicle position uh, loggers, as well as in installing the, the uh, mobile uh, real-time tracking systems, it has its challenges. One of them was that we began during the field season when the equipment was all occupied and personnel was occupied responding to fires. Or uh, The other part was that this forest is uh, 130 miles wide and 100 miles up and down, so it gets to be... Uh, quite a few hours just traveling around getting to places and trying to find the, the uh, engines to, uh, to install these in. Uh, the data that I'm using to, that will tie into this has challenges associated with it also. One is that there are already agreements working between agencies or within the agency of where the, how I get the data, how I deal with the data. And sometimes that's good that the pathway is smooth, but other times it's not really the data that I'd get myself uh, is one of those things where you have to have to uh, work with work with other people and sometimes it's not as uh, not as smooth as you make it yourself there's completeness problems the forest traditionally get their data to the forest boundary then they stop they're doing better they, they go out to the, the, uh, the quads the, the seven and a half minute quadrangles now beyond the forest boundaries but still it's, it's a limited data set and you will see that there's travel outside of the uh, the forest when you're getting from one point of forest to the other. And uh, the elevation models, once again, getting consistent models complete. Uh, to make broad scale models, I've, I've gone to a multi resolution uh, elevation model. And then all these different systems deal with each one, has, seems like it has its own datum and projection. And so there's a lot of shuffling back and forth between the, the spatial data. Uh, and this is something that you probably should read anyways. It's just kind of an ER diagram and a, and a relationship diagram of how the different pieces of data come together into a, a summary table and information that we can then look at one, one shot, one place to get, get our information out. Uh, looking at, at the data, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, ugly data. I guess that's the, the way transportation data is. Um, between the, the roads as well as the GPS information is it's not all as uh, cut and dried as, uh, as I was hoping it'd be back in April when I started this. But uh, I've, like I said, I've, I, I have a month's worth of data here, and I, I expected to have a full season as well as uh, continue on in multiple seasons. So I'm still doing a lot of exploratory work, looking for correlations and different ways that errors can occur and, and ways to use the database to capture those errors and, and toss them out or, or to fix them. I uh, am looking at uh, mixed models to uh, analyze the data, try to pull, pull together uh, a model to come up with this uh, travel resistance surface. Uh, sometimes it's so frustrating that I, I feel like I just want to go down to the neural network and let the, the black box figure out what it is. You, okay, uh, and uh, some of the difficulties with the data is that there are discontinuities, cliffs, rivers, 
that uh, stop travel from progressing. It will, you know, it should be fairly straightforward to make a high resistance to get across that. And then there is a large amount of data that has a lot of data in it. Once again, here's uh, looking at the uh, Human Tail National Forest in the light green there. We can see uh, the, oops, you can see the, the mouse up there on the screen. This is the uh, the area where I've, I've got data. Uh, this is the more smoother rolling area, and this is the more uh, dissected and, and topographically uh, challenged area. Hopefully, here's the uh, months of data. This is uh, the orange is a higher speed, and yellow is is a moderate speed, and green's a slower speed. Basically, what we'll do is I'll the next clip we'll be zooming in to this area a little bit southwest of Tupper at one of the guard stations. Let's see how this. And this is still currently all, all the data for eight engines across uh, these two southern districts. Uh, the one area up that, that you saw the orange line that went up to the north was going up to Pendleton on highways, state and uh, interstate highways. And you can see uh, the, these brown lines are the, uh, the forest level road network uh, with the topography behind it. There is this one little, uh, I kind of zoomed in on this area because there's this one red spot that looks like someone really floored it. <laughs> and I'll, uh, the next stop here, I'll go through the one, one uh, vehicle uh, on one day uh, data. And you can see that those data are all can, uh, to the right distance apart where this person, or this vehicle was really going along at the right speed, but the, uh, I'm confident that there's a equipment problem, a GPS. Uh, got a satellite mixed up or something because it, this guy isn't going 75 and it, along that road. It's physically impossible to speed up that fast and slow down enough to make it all all work like that. This is also showing some of the, the data. I've rasterized the data. Uh, and uh, you can see the, the blue here is a, a native um, material. And uh, we have gravel roads along here uh, just for surface type. It, this comes out of the standard Forest Service uh, GIS data. We have the operational maintenance levels. Um, this road that they're traveling along is uh, suitable for passenger uh, vehicles. It means that you can go on a, a standard um, gravel road out there. And uh, I derived slope and alignment, uh, slope from the elevation model. Um, basically, I broke up the, uh, the road network into smaller pieces and then uh, said what's the, what's the beginning point and ending point and made a slope out of that. It's not the most accurate thing, but over uh, I used about a quarter mile and uh, uh, broke these off into quarter mile chunks as, just to get a way to, to break it down or smooth it, to, to get that information at a finer resolution. And you can see that there are a couple of steep areas like down here in the southeast. Coming up this road, it gets a little steep. And to demonstrate even further how I broke that up, normally in GIS, these would be uh, just, there might be 20 lines on here, but I broke these up in where each one of these blue dots is. I put a, I, I got an elevation reading and then applied in a slope or in this case an alignment, how much uh, alignment being how crooked the road is, how much, how many times you wiggle before you, you get to a point that isn't, might not be that far away. And uh, it's, it's probably obvious that surface type and maintenance level we're uh, fairly collinear. I mean, if you uh, paved roads or for high-speed travel and they manage them that way, and uh, native uh, roads were uh, roads that they don't expect that much travel to go over. Uh, stepwise regression to the data that I did have uh, suggested uh, using everything, but it's uh, there's a lot of assumptions I made there that I, I really need more uh, research and data to to go further. So where I want to go in the future uh, after today is, is continue analysis of uh, this data as well as uh, next week I'll go out and collect the rest of the data for this season. Uh, it'd be nice if I had some more uh, data fields for the GPS so I could pull out you know, some of these uh, more odd readings I get. Uh, that was an attribute problem. There are other locational problems. <laughs> 
did uh, occasionally show up, whether the GPS units get, get the set, uh, satellite constellation mixed up or what. They're just not always on, and it just requires cleaning. And it'd be nice to do that automatically rather than having me you know, do a manual process. I'm looking. It seems like uh, to get a good mix of what's going on, I use a couple seasons and a couple different forests, and then uh, I want to expand where I'm now into foot travel as well as possibly look at uh, these heavy, heavy equipment like dozers. It looks like we only have one dozer in here today. And then uh, I, in, in the future, I want to put a, this into a publication. And I want to thank all the staff on the uh, Umatilla as well as Mark Willow, my uh, cohort here in Portland. Uh, that is, uh, he's the person who does the simulation. And that's it. You got any questions? Go ahead. Yeah, when the fire leaves the uh, forest and goes on the private sector, is there a coordination with the there is local a, a, a lot of the, the uh, I mean, we're not don't deal with that in the simulation, but um, a lot of the private is covered by state agreements and and because it's an interagency um, dispatch, uh, there are agreements between agencies and, and they uh, they'll be attacked and there are legal things on where the fire starts and who's responsible for it, uh, but they do all. But they will be continued. Mm -hmm. Is that close enough? Well, yeah. I'll okay. <laughs> Go ahead. You guys, uh, in your, I don't know where this would come into the application for fighting the fire, but it seems to me like satellite imagery would be very helpful in, in tracking. Uh, progress of a fire. Do you guys use any of that? It is, especially large fires. There's a, a certain size of a fire that Warm. you need. I mean, the heat the satellite can collect is uh, it has to be a certain size. There is a uh, MODIS is a satellite that goes by and it flies twice a day over the United States. And uh, they do processing. It's an automated system. And you can hit the website and see where the hotspots are. And once again, it's these big fires that have big uh, footprints, uh, initial attack, we try to keep them small and, and uh, try to hit them early. Uh, there's a lot of, once you start dealing with satellites, there's a lot of processing that occurs um, that slows things down. So they do have a pretty quick turnaround on that modus, I know. Uh, but And they're also, you know, the bigger the pixel you have, the quicker you can process it. So it's a trade-off between fine resolution. And, and they also have actually have flights, um, like jets, that have imagery. And they'll change their flight path depending upon where the, the hot spots are, where the hot fire season is nationally. Go ahead. So is the idea to take this data and the, the results of your model and try and improve travel times for? for well, no. My, my, I, I don't know how someone's going to use it, but my idea really is to be able to use it within the simulation system because you're starting from anywhere, going to anywhere essentially. You let the model, the simulation model, determine what the closest resource is. Uh, and the, the simulation model, you know, on the larger scale is used to, to come up, you play games for staffing and, and funding, um, but uh, is primarily for determining in, in real time the, uh, the travel time so you can determine the closest resource. It could also be used, uh, I guess, in a, in a dispatch situation to say you know, where your closest resource is, but that's really beyond the scope of what I'm looking at. Again? Started using it yet? The mo no, I'm still, uh, it's still pretty shaky, I, I guess, right now. I, I need to get some, at least this year's data uh, before I feel comfortable even using it in our simulation system. But I've been looking at the data and trying to clean it up pretty hard. Go ahead. Yes. Um, do you see applications, or are you going to share this model um, for other emergency management uh, or natural resource disasters like floods, um, avalanches, things like that? Yeah. Well, like I said, I'll put it into a publication. Um, and however anyone can use it, it yeah, I, I can see it being used in other situations. Uh, my hope is that you don't have to apply all this, you know, do all the data collecting 
uh, that I'm doing in this situation to apply elsewhere that we'll be able to find some key points that then we can extrapolate to other or interpolate to other forests without the, the data collection piece here. Um, yeah, the, uh, the uses are probably not limitless, but there are quite a few other places, ways you could use it. Go ahead. Um, so there's the short-term kind of incident reallocation of resources that this might be able to be used for, but in, in the Forest Service, how, what's the turnaround for, like how long does it take resources to really be shuffled, like between districts or between uh, In the season, you know, it's just as long as it takes them to drive. Um, but if you're talking on a programmatic level, they can look at that on a year-by-year -year basis uh, uh, within a forest. Um, the, then when you talk about resources across the region, and if they, they're changed based on funding levels, you know, up or down, usually it's like sea level up or down across the board. But uh, they could be reallocated fairly quickly. Uh, it's a lot of the, uh, there's, there's uh, permanent employees and there's a lot of extra in the summertime is, is, is temporary seasonal help. And uh, so that kind of stuff can be reallocated in a you know, year, a relatively short time for the, for the government. Yeah. Anything else? How often do you collect the data? Well, I'm still collecting it because I haven't picked up my, my data from this year. Most of the engines have actually been winterized. Uh, during the, uh, when they're on, on the road, it was every 15 seconds. We're collecting a data point. And, and that vehicle position logging is whenever they're moving, it, it, as, long as, as long as there's power, it's uh, collecting that data at that speed. Uh, there is a switch you can set so it doesn't collect it when, after you stop or if you're, there's, there's some movement, as, even if when you stop, the GPS will say you're, you're moving just because the position, I mean, that's the way the, the algorithms work, I guess, or it's not accurate enough. So there is a, a lower cutoff on how it will cut, it will stop collecting points uh, once you get down below, you know, a mile per hour. And then uh, it'll assume you're parked. And then once you start back up again, it'll pick up at 15, once every 15 seconds. Does the Forest Service pay for the black boxes? Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, it's, it's it's part of the research, and it's it's not like the black boxes that GM puts in your car. They're, these are add-ons. But uh, yeah, for and we the Forest Service bought these for this purpose. I mean, as far as the research. Okay. Is, is your lab the only one for the country? Is it a regionally allocated? There, there are two fire labs. There are other fire. Um, projects throughout the country, but there are two fire labs, one in Missoula and one down in Riverside, California. Are you restricted uh, to taking equipment to the wilderness areas? Um, I, I, I haven't been in wilderness area lately. Um, the main thing is motors. Like uh, I remember when I was a firefighter, we had to take in the old misery whips. If you're going to cut trees, you know, cut logs or something, uh, no chainsaws. I believe they can, don't don't go off and do this, but I believe you can take a helicopter in and land and, and, or, or let repellers out. Uh, you can fly over wildernesses, but they don't drive into wildernesses and they don't, uh, you know, mechanical or uh, internal combustion type of things. I can take my radio and there's a private individual and listen to, uh, you know, the AM radio or something, but it, it's not a, as far as, uh, it's primarily internal combustion, things that make noise and they can be. Okay. Anyone have any suggestions on where I should go from here? <laughs> Besides lunch? Okay, I think that does it. Thanks a lot for uh, showing up and good questions. Thank you. You're welcome.